In their personal view and experience, are there any particular conditions or circumstances which are currently creating additional pressure on ethics for those practicing in different professions? Because the reality of life is that the kind of clients that we're going to be seeing, if we're fortunate, are going to be in a hole. And often that hole is an extraordinarily difficult and complex one. So why have they come to us? They've come to us for a, a often complex and above all innovative solution. The dividing line between an innovative solution and one which is unethical is often going to be cigarette paper thin. The real question is, do I know that I have just strayed into unethical territory at all? Bear in mind in the context of LIBOR, the principal defence from those who were asking submitters to place um, submissions in a particular way, their principal defence was, I did not know that I was acting unlawfully, I did not think I was acting unethically, I thought everybody else was doing this, some of those defences have succeeded and some of them have failed. There is a very big issue of competition. I don't think professional firms are different to businesses. People today are under great pressure indeed, pressure to deliver on numbers and at the same time increasingly to be ethical in the way they behave and practice. And what I've seen in organisations, especially those who have been through problems and have had to show that they are taking ethical behaviour seriously, on one day people in the company are told, right, you've got to be ethical, everything you do must be absolutely beyond reproach. Second day, they are told, right, the important thing of delivery is delivery on numbers. You just must deliver your, your, your output. And they said, well, how do we cope with this? How do we reconcile these two things? And that is really very difficult. I think there is a greater emphasis now post-crisis, financial crisis, on ethics um, and how individuals are conducting themselves and what the tone from, from the top is. Um, and I think that's, um, you know, very much welcome that additional focus. I think that uh, a number of environments actually are, are under pressure in terms of uh, the economic model, um, profit. Uh, we've seen a, an environment where revenues have been static, uh, margins have been under pressure and so on and so forth. And I'm not sure that um, the uh, structures that exist within firms um, or indeed in-house teams or in businesses, um, when I say structures I include remuneration um, and how that's dealt with, promotion, how people um, are valued and recognised within organisations. I think some of that has yet to catch up with um, the, the reality or the new reality, if you like. The other thing is, um, which is very clear, is that um, there is a lot of popular or populist um, pressure uh, and that's being applied through, I suppose, governments uh, and other functions where Activities that were thought to be entirely lawful uh, and therefore beyond reproach are being looked at retrospectively um, and judged to be um, inadequate um, or indeed uh, contrary to, to the public interest and that's an important factor. Ethics and ethics coming under pressure maybe come, come in three ways into, into, into my world view. So the, fir the first one is what do we invest in? So there's a number of different investors who won't invest in tobacco or in armaments or in coal. And those come from ethical positions which they may take or the, their beneficiaries, the people they're representing, will, will take. I think there's a real challenge for the rule of law in society today. Uh, and it's partly to do with this question of ethics. Because one of the things that I have observed in the 30-something years that I've been in the legal profession, 20 of them working for corporates, is that actually what the legal position is, what the position in law is, is increasingly irrelevant. What really matters is what <coughs> does the court of public opinion think? Or to be more precise, what does the court of the most vocal public opinion? And that's when I think holding to what is lawful is really, really important. 
And so with that on one side, and I think that in upholding the rule of law in those situations and behaving in a way that is lawful is a very, very helpful moral compass, it then becomes really challenging when in this country, for example, which I think because I'm English is kind of one that upholds the rule of law, when there is increasing pressure on companies not to do what is lawful because that is no longer seen to be good enough. So you talked about uh, a lot of tax avoidance <coughs> and lawyers being criticized because what they advised on was legally correct but is now viewed as being ethically unacceptable. I have a real problem with that. I, th I think the first thing to say is uh, that the last couple of years has seen a lot of pressure on, on, the, on the business environment. And certainly in the oil and gas space, we've seen a significant decrease in the crude price, which has really uh, impacted, um, had a big pressure on costs, uh, on project delivery, and ultimately on, on people. And when you're in a pressured business environment, there's always uh, going to be uh, pressure on all sorts of things. Safety is one, and perhaps ethics and compliance is, is another. So uh, that's certainly got the potential to have uh, to create some tension. I think the other thing I would say is that uh, there is an increased societal uh, expectation of corporations around ethics and compliance. Uh, and I think a lot of that has been born from a list of, uh, of, of scandals that, uh, that we've experienced in, uh, over the, the last couple of years. I always think it's very interesting when professions say we're different and lawyers are different and all the issues concerning lawyers are different and special. Actually, some of these things are just basic core truths. And I think one of the points which actually Lord Gold has already referred to is that the pressure comes from pressure to, refor to, to perform and fear of what will happen to you if you don't deliver. Um, when those pressures get too big in any organisation, then the tendency is for people to cheat and cover up. Um, and that applies in the law, it applies in any company, and indeed I think one of these things, these, the, 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 the points about a lot of scandals in corporations is they arise from um, over-ambitious targets, um, actually, and driven by fear of uh, underperformance. I think an overbearing compliance regime actually can be very damaging because it causes people to cover up mistakes. And it would be nice, wouldn't it, if people were complying or behaving well because they wanted to. If your starting point becomes reputation and the rule of law comes second, you're going to get it wrong. The right way is to start with what is the right way to proceed according to the law and then turn and look at the reputational overlays. And at the moment, I think, so far as the court of public opinion is concerned, they expect that to go the other way. That disgraceful piece which said the enemies of the people in the wake of Article 50 said what the judges should have done is worked out what the people wanted the answer to be yeah. and, then, and then reverse engineer the law into that. That is the way uh, to, to absolute disaster. One of the things we remind uh, those coming into the profession is actually that they have a reputation that other people will borrow and misuse if it's to their advantage and be very careful about that. When people are in organisations, in groups, the pressures on them are different to the pressures they face in their personal lives. And I like to use the example of crossing the road. If I cross the road by myself, I look and see if a car is coming, and I don't cross till there is no car. Um, if I cross the road with 12 other people who want to get to the other side, I go when they go. The guard is down, and there is a sort of convention, and you behave as the group behaves. People, organisations, believe sometimes believe that if they have a bull, they have a whole series of laws and they tick the box because everyone mm. has been trained in those laws that they are then ethical. Actually, it's not the case at all. You have to get inside the heads and the bloodstream of the people you are dealing with to make them appreciate the issues and slowly, because it does take a very long time, you change their culture and you then achieve the ethical be good behaviour that you want. I think you're right to identify it as a real, uh, real challenge. Um, and um, it, you, you, you run the risk of being either too light and everybody ignores you or being too over, overbearing. And as you say, everybody regards it as a, a, as a tick box exercise. 
And I think my, my view is that you've got to um, continue to be thinking about um, how you communicate with your organisation, um, uh, the routes in which you choose to do so, and I think you'd, yeah, there, there has to be a mix. Some of it has to come from you as a compliance officer, some of it has to come from the top management, some of it has to come through, through middle management, and you need to keep on mixing it up, because as soon as you get stuck in one, in one particular frame of, of communication, whether it be training or emails or whatever, it, it happens to be, it, people start to lose uh, lose focus on it. So I, so I think an effective compliance program is actually one which is quite dynamic um, and is keeping on thinking about, okay, we've, we've just done this, what is the next different thing we can do to get our message home? Yeah, I just wanted to say something about middle management because I think they've been getting a really hard time <laughs> this morning. Yes. Um, and I bet all of us in this room either are or have been middle managers yeah. and I don't think we would feel that our own ethical compasses sort of veered off suddenly because we reached that marzipan level. Um, so I think, I think we need to be careful about using generalizations. Um, and uh, I think it does come back to what David was saying about being very mindful of what are the drivers on an individual's behavior at any given time. I was talking yesterday to uh, somebody who works in another company's uh, legal house, uh, legal department, and uh, they were talking about how often when there has been an ethical or a, a breach of their code of conduct, how often the issue was actually not to do with the employee, was triggered not by the uh, employee's workplace environment, but actually something that was happening to them in their private lives. Mm -hmm. And I think that's quite important. Is to, is, so I think when you're, when you're developing a compliance program, it's, I think you need to do it in a way that absolutely doesn't end up at, at box ticking, but enables a sufficiently nuanced understanding of the people in your organization and, uh, and what can be happening at any, at any given time. Mm -hmm.